So if I could, I don't know if this is turned on. I don't know if this is, is it on? If I could ask everyone to take their seats. I love the excitement in the room, and I hate to stop the excitement in the room, but you know, we have to have time to listen to our esteemed and wonderful guest, and then to ask lots of exciting questions, and then to have more time to have all this excitement, but over food and wine. So that's very important for all of us. So let me wish you all a good evening. I'm thrilled to welcome all of you to the 10th Pinnacle Lecture Series. It is amazing to me that um, this is such a well-established tradition and that so many of you are, might be here new, but how many of you I'm getting to see who have been here for many, many of the Pinnacle Lecture Series. It has been a really wonderful part of our semester here. So as many of you know, this is really a time that we gather and come together as a community in nursing to think about nursing leadership and, and where we are and where we're going and what this might mean to our own careers. Before I introduce our guest and before we start thinking about where we are as a community in leadership, I have just a few housekeeping details. This is always a part of leadership. There's always a housekeeping detail. So um, some of you I know will be very interested in the 1.5 contact hours that are provided by the Boston College Cannell School of Nursing um, continuing education um, program. So if you haven't signed up for your continuing education that was out at the registration desk before you leave, please make sure that they have your name it's really important that you register so that we can then send you the link for the evaluation which you have to do to be able to get your contact hours. The um, contact hours are going to be sent to whatever email address you sent to us so you might if you have more than one you might just want to remember which one and after you do the evaluation we'll send you in that email address a certificate so that will be great. So. That was really the only housekeeping I had. That's so much better than when you have to tell everybody where the bathrooms are and all those kinds of things. So I shouldn't complain. Let me have the great pleasure and honor of introducing our guest today. Dr. Antonia Villaruel is a professor and the Mar Margaret Bond Simon Dean of Nursing at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. She's also director of Penn's WHO Collaborating Center for Nursing and Midwifery Leadership. I'm going to tell you all these wonderful things that are true of her, but I'd like to start out saying that one of the things that I love the most is that many years ago in a different place in both of our lives, I had the great honor and privilege of working along with her when neither of us ever knew there would be a day when we would be deans. And we had a lot of fun, <laughs> which is a great thing. And I continue to have a lot of fun, and I can't tell you how excited I was to see because you may or may not know this, but I, I have two children who both have degrees from Penn and a husband who has two degrees from Penn. And in my family, everybody always said, so what's different about you? <laughs> Which was the, you have no degrees from Penn. <laughs> Which I would then have to do a big long sigh and say, and whose tuition benefits? But that's another story. <laughs> so everyone in my family shares the great excitement of having Dr. Villaruel here. So let me tell you some of the fantastic things about her that you're going to um, be hearing a little bit, I, I hope, in terms of her um, leadership journey but that might help you to understand it a little bit more. So she's a former board member of the American Academy of Nursing, was elected to the Institute of Medicine in 2007, and her research as a bilingual and bicultural nurse researcher has focused on health promotion, health disparities, and community participation with extensive research and practice with a number of different Latino and Mexican populations and communities. 
So for all of her career, I would say, she's really worked in communities and with communities to help identify what kind of research is important to them. Really community-led research and, and where it is we're going. So when I was thinking about what kinds of things we've talked about leadership and what kinds of things we haven't, being able to think about how do you lead from within and lead as a part of a group and lead where people wanna go, I once had a, a dean who said to me, you can lead anywhere you want. The question is, does anybody follow? <laughs> and I, I do think it's wonderful to look at um, Dr. Villaruel's career and see not only all the places she's led, but the many different people who have followed there. So today she's going to speak with us about her experience, leadership, and success using a community-led approach. And so without any further ado, let me welcome with tremendous pleasure, Dr. Antonia Villaruel. Thank you, Susan. It uh, really is a pleasure for me to be here. As uh, uh, Susan said, we had great fun in our um, first lives together when we were at Penn, and we hope to, I hope to continue to have great fun in our dean circles together. Um, it's also, this, this does feel a lot like home, and I think in part because so many of you are um, Penn alums or Penn, um, had crossed paths in Penn, and so just, I would like for those who are from Penn to please raise your hands and can see who you are. That's really wonderful, really wonderful. So I bring you, I bring you greetings uh, from my new home at the University of Pennsylvania, and I just wanna share with the audience that you too can be a Penn alum and or Penn faculty. So look forward to uh, seeing you at your new home um, in Philadelphia. As uh, Susan said, I was asked to talk today about my work in, in communities uh, from a research perspective. And I will say that my research, my work didn't start off in communities. And in fact, I worked um, many years at a children's hospital, in fact, long enough to get retirement from. Uh, I, I know I look so young, I look so young. But uh, it was actually through the process of, of doing work in, at Children's Hospital of Michigan that I became interested in research and actually started doing work in communities, primarily because I needed access to a culturally diverse population that amazingly I couldn't find at Children's Hospital in Michigan in the heart of the Latino, in the heart of the Latino community. And so when I um, wanted to get access, we were doing a uh, validation of a pain assessment me measure and we needed access to Hispanic and African American kids. I went to the Community Health Center, which is now a federally qualified health center. And I went to the, um, met with the director and said, you know, I said, oh my gosh, I need access. How am I gonna sell that I need access and that I wanna do research and this is what I wanna do. And so, you know, I, I went and called Mr. Ricardo Guzman and said, this is Antonia Villaruel. You know, I grew up in the community here and this is something that I wanna do. Can I meet with you? And he said, sure. So I talked to him about what I wanted to do and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he said, I only, and I said, well, what can I, you know, I'm gonna be parked out in your waiting room. And I said, how, what is it that I can do for you in return? And he said, well, I just want one thing. And he said, I want you at the end of your research project to come and share with us what you found and what you did, which I thought was a reasonable request. And I said, sure, not a problem. So I did that. And so it turned out, he tells me, that I was the first person that ever did research in that community setting that ever came back to share any results of the group. And so it was in my, my um, as I was just starting in my research career, it was almost a parallel career working with Ricardo and this federally qualified health center to work on issues that were important to the, to the community. And it was in the middle of my dissertation that I decided I don't wanna do research in pain anymore. I want to work with my community. And so I was thinking about changing my dissertation topic and, and he gave me the wise advice. It's like, just get out, which I, uh, which I, which I did. And then um, after that decided to go, um, because I really wanted to work in communities, wa wanted to work in prevention, that I did a postdoc at the University of Michigan on health, on health promotion risk reduction. And it was really, I think both Ricardo and I were at pivotal points in our career 
where we did work side by side, where he ended up learning more about research and community-based participatory research is, is a journey we worked on together. Um, but then, you know, again, that really is what opened my, my work and my passion for doing work in communities. So I'm going to share with you um, things that I've learned along the way in terms of engaging communities in research, some of the challenges that we all face at whatever level we work at. I want to share with you some elements of successful partnerships, not only from my experience, but what's in the literature. Give you some exemplars, again, from my work and from others. And then for us to think about some future directions in terms of where we need to go in the field. So when we think about roles of communities in research, I mean, there are many roles that they play, some of them simultaneously, some of them, um, again, at different points in time, and some of them just because that's what they do. So communities are gatekeepers. They can be facilitators. We know that they can certainly block you <laughs> from doing research. Uh, community members can be engaged in communities, engaged in experts in whatever area it is that we, we want to do. Sometimes we'll engage communities because we want support or for that grant application, we need an endorsement that says, yes, we agree, and yes, we support Dr. So-and-so to do this work here. Sometimes we engage them as collaborators and working on particular aspects. Uh, sometimes we take that uh, a, a step further and working with them as partners. Hopefully, they'll be beneficiaries of what the product and the process of the research is. And in other aspects, we work in terms of supporting communities in the research that they want to work on and then they want to lead. And so, dependent on the roles, we have different levels of engagement from none, and sometimes that is appropriate, to letting to notification, letting people know that we're in the community and doing work, to again, looking for their consent or endorsement, looking for their participation from consultants to active participants in some or all phases, again, depending on how you engage. And then finally, um, working as partners from a community-based participatory action research model is that I call the mother load of all uh, participation to, again, uh, some of the work that I've been involved in lately um, and others have been too in terms of helping communities be consumers of good research. So just like we're moving towards evidence-based practice in hospital settings, communities are also feeling the push to, again, if they want funding, to be able to use evidence-based work. So with working with communities, um, we, face a number of we face a number of challenges. Um, so we have the struggle working in an academic or even service setting of bridging that divide between what we do in communities and what we do in un universities. And there's many reasons for the challenges. Um, there's differences in perceived power. People think that from even schools of nursing who are embedded in universities have lots of money lots of free money hanging around that they can support uh, family, uh, support communities to be able to do. In many communities, there's a history of tenuous relationships. So at the, <coughs> the University of Pennsylvania, we sit, sit in West Philadelphia, which has an array of, prob of problems. And even though we're in better terms than we were 10, 15 years ago, it's still tenuous because people have really short memories. And the first time you do something that's wrong, it's like, well, remember? I mean, you haven't changed that much because that happened to us X amount of years ago. We also have different constituencies. We, um, we have different bosses. We have different things that we have to achieve in order to be successful. And communities have different obligations as well to their residents. And importantly, there's financial realities that guide both university and health system research and community-based funding that set up these relationships in a tenuous fashion that, again, can make work difficult. Other challenges is, again, um, again from literature and from what we know, is that communities perceive universities as being, disrespect, uh, being disrespectful that they don't use and they don't see local skills and expertise or use them in a way that's relatively meaningful. There's also a history of community distrust, <coughs> the perceived and actual real historical abuses of neglect. I mean, the legend of Tuskegee is, is one, but every ethnic community has a similar story of, um, you know, whether it be the not Navajo in, uh, infected with, I think it was smallpox, one of those diseases to the forced sterilization of, of Puerto Rican women in the Philadelphia area. Every, every group has that history of 
um, has a, a history of abuse. And again, we don't even have to go to historical, but people have stories of someone who wasn't provided the right information, or again, what they see as being targeted for, for work. Our mission as a university is both education and research, and in the communities, many times it's a service mission. How we approach things is very different. We have an analytical frame using analytical skills where communities have a political orientation. They know how to work and how to rally and how to get resources and also experiential knowledge of what's worked and what hasn't worked in their particular community. The intellectual products that are important to us are journal articles and again I think we're getting away from some of that whereas what uh, what communities care about are client-centered programs. How is this going to result into action? So one of the, the you know, again, stories that I want to say is that even though people understand that there are some differences, communities do understand the importance of some of this to us. So as an example, in one of the community-based participatory research programs at Michigan that I was working at, one of the assistant professors who had been very active and doing some great scholarship in the community didn't get tenure. And so the, the, the community was, was very upset because it had been a trusted partner who had worked side by side, great input. That made them understand the importance of, of what was important to us, the journal articles. They know that without the journal articles, without the funding, that we can't be in the communities doing good work. And so that's why I was sharing with some of my colleagues today is that the most important thing that you can do in terms of the work that you want to be in, do in the community is to be successful in your own environment because that's going to keep you working and engaged in that particular area. So, and again, other challenges is that, again, when we think about research, we think about these long-term gains and particular research funding, whereas communities are looking at, they have an issue that they need to deal with now, and again, they focus on pro programmatic funding. So, you know, again, when we think about how long it takes us to develop an idea, get the NIH grant, implement the grant, think about findings, we're thinking about a seven to 10 year period. And the issue that communities are dealing with is, is something that they need to deal with now. So it's what is it that you're going to give them. So the impetus for them engaging in research that you think is important does very little or may do very little for them at the beginning. So again, it's a, it's a bridge that we need to divide. For many of us in universities, relationships are funding dependent. So it's like, you know what, I want to do work, I want to do really good work, but you know what, if I don't get the grant, that means I can't work with you. I'll see you later, I'll see you when the next RFA comes or when the next work, when, when next, the next work happens. And for communities, the relationships are, are, are dependent on the relationship. So again, if you care about me and care about my community, then I'm gonna see you more often than when money's available. So having that constant presence is, is important. So I will tell you that when I was, when I was, in, Philadelphia, when I was in Philadelphia, um, it took me um, three or four years in order to get funded, but I stuck with the community and I stuck with, again, different work and projects either that I was doing, so that when, by the time that the grant came, they all, I was a known entity to them. So even though the funding didn't come right away, I was there and again, it made, things, it made things easier. So I guess the good news was that I didn't get funded right away. So it allowed all this time for me to develop great community trust. Didn't feel like that at the, at the, at the time. So the other component that we're looking at is we're looking at translation of research and the use of evidence-based interventions in communities is that we also have um, a bridge to to connect when we're looking at the use of research-driven models. So again, and the area that I work in is, is um, sexual risk reduction. So there's been a, a move in my field, in um, primarily by the Office of Adoles Adolescent Health, to have communities use evidence-based models. And CDC has a similar model um, in using, uh, funding communities only to use evidence-based models. So the problem with that, with that in terms of translation is it relies on work, um, work from uh, randomized controlled trials, it relies on academics. And many of the interventions that people are being asked to adopt have had lim limited community involvement in the development, and so they have little ownership of what's in that model as well. And we rely on um, 
again, tiers of evidence. So we rely on, you know, how good is the evidence that shows your, uh, that your intervention is efficacious? Is it an RCT? And usually things below that don't really matter in terms of, again, um, models that the government in particular is looking to, to produce. Many of our interventions, because of the science that we're working in and because of where we're at in the science, rely on a single focus. So you only do pregnancy prevention, but God forbid you do pregnancy prevention and violence prevention, even though they're related. Or you can do pregnancy prevention, but you can't do HIV prevention, even though when you think about it, you can get HIV AIDS the same way that you get pregnant. So again, that has to do with some of the funding models, but again, it's, it's, it's difficult. And so what the contention with the community is, communities are coming back and saying, you know what, we have approaches that work. We have a good program that's been successful. Why aren't you using what we've developed? And so again, models may be community driven. They focus on local sol solutions and expertise and knowledge of, the communi of, of communities. When communities are looking at attacking a, a particular problem, it's very few that will say, well, let me look at, um, let me look at the evidence and let me see what programs are evidence-based and let me see which ones have the best evidence. That's probably not how they choose particular interventions. And my colleagues talks about instead of tiers of evidence, but the tiers of, you know, the tiers of evidence. It's like we have no evidence or we have, you know, we have in our gut, we know it, we know it works, but again, having difficulty knowing what the it is and uh, little evidence that it works and, and again, how it works, you know, people come. And again, in communities, people are looking at how is it that we can develop a comprehensive focus versus, again, these isolated um, interventions that we have. And so I love this quote here, is that where did the field get the idea that evidence of an intervention's efficacy from carefully controlled trials could be generalized as the best practice for varied populations and, and situations? In my community, one of my colleagues, um, an agency that I worked with, got funded by the CDC to um, implement an intervention that had been um, that had been developed for African Americans. And so when they went to, and they had to use um, an evidence-based intervention, although none of them had ever been tested with Lat Latino populations. And so when they went to get trained on the intervention, the trainers were upset that this Latino community was using their intervention. It's our intervention, it was developed for us, and we don't want you to use it. Now, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the developers, but again, it was people that were implementing. So there wasn't even any space in that adaptation. Well, that caused all sorts of uproars. Um, and it was, but it was, a good, it was a good thing that happened because the Latino community bonded together, and not just in Michigan, but all over, and said to the CDC, if you're expecting us to use evidence-based interventions, then you have to have interventions that have been designed with our, po with our population, or at least tested. So I want to talk a little bit about community engagement in research. And again, I think we use that, we use the terms and the words to mean different things in different, you know, different ways. I certainly don't say I use community based participatory action research because I've worked with the, you know, I, I consider that the holy grail and have worked with the, with the prophet herself at, at Michigan. So I say I use community informed uh, research. But community engagement is the application of institutional resources to address and solve challenges uh, facing communities through collaboration with these communities. And the community engaged scholarship is scholarship that involves the faculty member in a mutually beneficial partnership with the community. I think the struggle with what we do here is how do we produce things that are important to the community but still meet the standards of what we need to do in order to be successful in our areas. So what we know about com quality and uh, community engagement and research um, through a synthesis of literature that was done is that quality research and community involvement are not contrary to each other. I mean, you can have both. You can have great quality, um, great research and high community involvement. Importantly, successful partnerships do not guarantee quality research. I've had um, colleagues come to me and say, you know, I've, I went to the community and I asked them what they wanted us to study or what they wanted us, wanted us to do. And I went to, my, went to my colleagues in the community, it's like, I can't do that, you know, because I have, idea, I mean, I have ideas. I mean, I have, I mean we, all, we have different types of knowledge, but I have ideas, I have knowledge, I have 
whatever, and I can't come in with a blank slate. I mean, that's not how you create science. So somewhere in, somewhere in the middle is where things need to go. What, um, what these folk found in the literature is that the stage of development of partnerships may be related to type and quality of research. So in the literature that they examined, most of the research had been, that had been done was very descriptive in nature. It might have been related to instrument development. So the quality in itself, I mean, there were very few randomized control trials that were done with community participation, again, because the partnerships were a little unequal, didn't equal the development of the science. And so the thinking is, is that the more advanced the partnership is, then the more advanced the research might be. I'm not sure I, I believe that, but that's one issue. And then the important component is, can quality research be conducted without successful community partnerships? I think that's a good, an important question to ask. The other component is, as we're thinking about moving research into practice, and again, the use of evidence-based interventions, we have, to change the, we have to change our model. Most of what we do is we look at a need, we you know, look at a problem, develop an intervention, we test it, and then we analyze and publish the reports. And what we're all knowing is that that's not, that's not enough. If we're really going to make good impact, we have to figure out a way for communities to be able to use the work that we're doing. So again, the route that communities do is maybe identify an effective intervention, translate it into intervention packages, transfer it to end users, and to provide ongoing support. Or uh, what I should have said is this is additional work that we as researchers need to be able to do or else we need to help others do that work in order to translate because we can't think that just because we have a great RCT that we're doing in a controlled setting that communities are going to be able to do the same thing and um, develop the same outcome. So as I said before, there's a, a push um, in uh, for communities in using evidence-based interventions. So the technology push is looking to strengthen practice-oriented research. So again, evaluating the impact of, of the work that we're doing um, by research. By looking at community co uh, collaboration from development through dissemination, and I'm going to talk about what I've done in, in some of the work that I've done. And then there's the market pull, that there's an accountability for program efficacy. So again, it's not just taking a program, but making sure that once it's implemented in a community that you can have similar, uh, uh, similar outcomes. And then marketing the benefits of evidence-based intervention. So what is, if I adopt this intervention in my community, what is that going to mean for me? What's going to be the cost? What's going to be the benefit? And then importantly, develop, thinking about developing and delivering um, capacity. So how is it that we provide and train um, and provide technical assistance? How is it that we make sure that um, our communities are implementing with fidelity? And what type of outcome evaluation is necessary? So again, funding agencies like CDC and other practice-oriented components are really looking at, at communities to be able to do this. So when we think about community engagement and thinking about what the work that we need to do, again, work have identified the keys to successful partnerships. And so the first one is the development of, of trust. And again, I think that's, an, you know, how you operationalize that trust, I think, is, is an important, um, it's an important journey. And I'm not sure, and we have some elements of, of what that means, and I'm sure you have some ideas there as well. But the trust component is important. So trust means also respecting the personal experiences of the community members. So valuing what it is that they bring to the table. It doesn't mean that you have to follow everything that they say needs to be doing, but understand their experiences. So as an example, I was looking to do a, um, uh, this is when I was in Philadelphia, I was working with, uh, with members of the Puerto Rican community, and I'd already gotten support for an adolescent intervention that I wanted to do. And one of my colleagues received some money that we were going to work with together to replicate one of her studies. It was, a, it was an intervention to help mothers talk to their sons about sex and condom use, et cetera. And so we wanted to replicate that in the Puerto Rican community. So I got some of the community leaders around and I said, you know, this is what we, this is what we want to do. What do you think? And they said, you can't do that. And I said, well, why can't we? And they said, well, because it's against the culture for mothers to talk to their sons about condom, you know, condom use, they're not going to want to be able to do that. They said, why don't you do a father-son um, intervention? And I said, because we have money for a mother's <laughs> <laughs> intervention. We don't have money for a father-son intervention. And so I will tell you that there were four men and one woman around this table telling me that I couldn't do this. 
And I said, all right, I said, well, this is what I would like to do. And, and I, I know it was their truth. And I said, what I would like to do is I would like to talk to women in the community, mothers in the community, and talk to them about this idea and see what they think. And then based on what they think, I'll come back and we can see where we go from there. And they said, they said fine. So sure enough, we did focus with focus groups with, with mothers and we said, we already talked to our kids about sex. We're not sure if we're telling them the right things. We would love for you to help us to be able to do that. And I said, isn't it against your religion or against the culture? And they said, we don't care, you know? <laughs> we're the ones responsible for raising our sons, and so this is what we need to do. And so that's the message that I, I took back to the community leaders. You know, it wasn't that they were lying. It wasn't that they were trying to block. It really was what they believed. But I respected them enough to say that may be true, and they respected me enough to say, you need to find out and let's, let's be sure. So again, it was respecting the experiences and again, knowledge that we had. Importantly, there has to be a commitment to serving the community. And as I said, that's not gonna happen if you helicopter in and helicopter out, or if you do it just based on, on what your particular funding is. So whatever way that that means that you're, you show, express commitment to communities, I think that's something that's important to do. We were talking earlier in some discussions with faculty that you know, an maybe an ideal way is that you link your, you know, you can't do research and you can't do teaching and you can't do service. You know, it's hard when they're, they're not connected, but if you can figure out a way to connect all those together, so with the courses you're teaching or again, your volunteer work or your practice, then it just makes things a lot easier and people see that you're in there for the long term. And then I think importantly, accountability for what you do and for what you don't, for what you don't do. So as I mentioned, this issue of trust is, is difficult, but again, in focus groups and work that's been done, these are constructs that are important in relation to trust. It's being dependable so that you deliver when you say you're going to, and if you can't, you communicate that. That what you do is of mutual uh, benefit. Doesn't have to be equal, but it should be a mutual benefit. And people can owe you, and you can owe, you know, what, what it is you give back to communities. But again, it's that whole relationship component. There has to be clear communication in terms of where you're going and what the outcomes are and what the process is like. It's being truthful and being responsible for what you say you're going to be doing. It's being accessible and flexible so that if you had a particular design in mind or a particular approach and it wasn't you know, available or there's a resistance is that you're able to work and to change things as well. Um, that you're able to value differences and that you share both power and responsibility. So building, building trust, again, as I mentioned, is difficult, difficult when we're talking about com uh, communities because the development and maintenance occurs at the individual level, um, not necessarily at the institutional level. When I first came to Penn, um, as I was meeting with some members of the community, they said to me, um, Tony, we'll work with you, we'll support you with whatever you do. Just don't tell people from, you're from Penn because the doors will be closed to you. And people from Penn thought, you know, hey, we're University of Pennsylvania. You know, everybody knows us, everybody loves us. Well, you know, A wasn't, wasn't true. And it was that they didn't, it wasn't anything Penn had done. It's just that they had never known anybody from Penn to come into the community because I was doing work that wasn't in West Philadelphia and people from Philly thought that, or from Penn thought that, well, that territory is temples. Uh, territory, and, I, and I'm saying universities don't own communities. Communities decide who it is that they want to be able to, to, work, to work with. Had another example in another institution where I was working with, um, we were working on a, on a interdisciplinary collaboration with, um, with my community. And we had, um, between some of my colleagues or between uh, the School of Medicine, School of Nursing had some had some issues and that we weren't able to resolve, so the School of Nursing stepped back. And I told my colleagues in the community, and I said, you know, um, I just wanted to let you know that we're not going to be working as part of this project anymore. We had some issues that don't have anything to do with you that we're stepping out. And my colleague says, well, if you're stepping out, I'm stepping out. 
And I just said, well, you don't have to do, you know, you don't have to do that. I mean, the issue was between us. And it's like, well, no, the whole reason I came into this is because we were working with you. And if that's not going to happen, we're going to step out. And I'm going to write a letter to the funding agency that says we're withdrawing our support. And I was like, oh my gosh, you can't, you can't do that. And I said, can you at least talk to, you know, the PI to let him know that you were, you were doing that. So again, the, the relationship was at the individual level and not at the, not at the, uh, at the university level. So communities in this, in this study really felt that responsible for, uh, the responsibility for trust was on the academic partners. So we had more to do to try and, and we have more to do to try and win the trust of communities and not the other way around. And that communities identified my, more struggles in developing and maintaining that trust for whatever reason. So again, you can tell that working in communities takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort, you know, it takes a lot of effort to be able to do. So now I'm going to be talking about some exemplars in terms of some of the work that I've done in the community and some of the work uh, for others as well. So as I mentioned, when I was at Michigan, I was part of the Detroit um, University Research Center collaboration that was established in 1995 and is still going strong. Um, this is headed by um, Barbara Israel, who if you know anything about community-based participatory uh, research, know that she's the, you know, she's the prophet of this, uh, of this approach and this work and has really been the engine that's, uh, that's kept this moving. Um, it's a relationship between um, public health, nursing, and social work, and again, unites two areas on the, in Detroit, both the south, where we're talking about um, communities before the southwest side and east side of Detroit. So the funny, well, it's, I was going to say the funny story, it's not so, it wasn't so funny at the time, but when I came to Michigan, one of the um, things that I wanted to do was to be part of this uh, community-based research in particular because the work that they were doing was in my community. It was in southwest Detroit. And when I looked around at the academic partners, there were no, there was one African, one African American, there were no Latinos. And so I said, I want to be part of this because I want to do research. I mean, I didn't need this to do research, but I wanted to be part of that, the colleagues doing work. And so Barbara said, well, you know, we don't have nursing as a partner. And I said, not a problem. You know, so I, I got a joint appointment at the School of Public Health. And she said, well, just because you have a joint appointment at the School of Public Health doesn't mean that you can be part of this, the, this collaborative. And she goes, but if you want to, you can come to the meetings. And I was like, are you kidding? Are you kidding me? You know, you think I have time to come to meetings that aren't going to benefit me? The real issue, the real issue was is that they had never developed a mechanism for including new partners. And what she meant to say was that in order for you to be here, the community has to agree for you to be part of this initiative. And I said, I can agree to that. And then she delivered what she thought was bad news and said, well, you know, this isn't about you as an individual, it's about you as a school. So the school is the partner and it's like, well, better for us because that allows other people to be part of this initiative. So again, um, it was an, 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 it's an important uh, vehicle for research. And again, you can read the definition of um, what the goals were. Again, there was initial funding from the CDC as part of these uh, urban research um, centers and the funding no longer exists. So the focus is to develop um, relevance of public health problems and really to focus on social determinants of health. The collaborative started with identifying areas of strength of, of researchers at the university, but over time that really changed to incorporate the issues that the community were felt were important. And so again, this whole component is designed to enhance the capacity of community-based par participants in the process. And so here are important URC principles that we use as commandments, that the community is involved in all phases of the research process as, appro as appropriate. We work to strengthen collaborations among community members and um, and university partners, but also with some of the public health agency, and also, again, between communities. Southwest Detroit is a primarily Latino community, east side of Detroit, African American community, and sometimes the communities didn't work very well together either, but with shared agendas, we were able to move in that, di in that direction. And all of us were committed to producing and disseminating findings that could be used in relevant ways. And so initially, much of the work, as I mentioned before, was descriptive in nature, but we still had an obligation to try and translate. So what were the lessons learned, and what do we know about the work that we've done, and how can we present that in a way that's beneficial to the community? 
So as a collaborative, we've had many, many successes. Um, importantly, we've been able to produce good science. We've been able to develop and su uh, support a community infrastructure to reduce health disparities. And some of the areas that we've worked on primarily have been in um, cardiovascular risk and also, also diabetes and also youth-related issues. Again, in the collaborative, you get into this area of chasing money as well because you need that in as important to keep the collaborative moving. We have an important education and research infrastructure to develop a health disparity. So again, this is something that's incorporated as part of our educational mission um, in all schools. Uh, community, we have a um, summer research program that's focused on CBPR that's co-taught by community members and academics. Importantly, we've been able to develop policy initiatives to support health in those respective communities. So again, it shows the maturity of the research that's been able to uh, produce. As I mentioned, the new partnership among members between East and Southwest side, and then um, importantly, focusing on interdisciplinary approaches. So a couple of the, the research programs that I've been involved in in that has been, um, and again, I start with one that didn't work as, as well as it perhaps should have, is called La Vida, and this is a, um, a violence against women network that was at the federally qualified health center that I've spoken about. I had a postdoc there at the time who was working with, with, um, with the community, and uh, there was a call from CDC that said, you know, we're looking at int interested in testing um, interventions that are based, that are community-based interventions to reduce violence. And so the community had a program that was targeted towards um, people who had committed uh, domestic violence and instead of going to jail were had to come to this, um, come to this particular program. And this was sponsored by uh, folk at the Federally Qualified Health Center. But what they found in terms of developing this, um, this program, because they left it open to the community, is that many men who had, were recent immigrants, Latino immigrants, really came and resonated with this program more for the fellowship that they had in that area. Because again, there's lots of changes that men faced in terms of uh, coming to the country, not finding jobs, their wives may be finding jobs and dealing with differential and power dynamics. So the community wanted to see, you know, can we, can we test this and can we look to see if this is effective? So we said, sure, not a problem. They said we wanted to be, they wanted to be PIs. And I said, sure, not a problem. We, we wrote the grant. Um, we worked on developing the intervention because the intervention was in this person's head. And so we got it out of his head onto paper and uh, worked to develop and test the intervention. It didn't go as well as we, we planned, and I was thankful that I was not the PI. Um, <laughs> very thankful I was not the PI because the, the culture of research that's needed for a randomized control trial and was a wait, it was a waitlist component was really difficult for the community. They didn't have the expertise to be able to do that. We talked about um, implementing a curriculum with fidelity and uh, even though this, uh, we had one facilitator who actually helped, we helped him write the curriculum that he did, didn't deliver it in the same way, so we couldn't figure out, in fact, what it was that we were testing. There were issues, he had issues, the community did with a waitlist control group, even though that's what we talked about, something that we needed to do. The follow-ups were bad because the, who staffed the agency, who staffed the program were also providing direct service, so if you have to struggle between, do I work with this woman who is in a real, you know, bad situation in an abusive situation and I need to get her out now or do I go out and do a three month data collection? I mean, what's going to win over? So again, this just tells you, um, again, a demonstration of, you know, great partnership, great idea, didn't, didn't work out in the way that it needed to be, but again, I think lesson learned for all of us. So the challenges in the, in, the UR, in the URC, as I mentioned, we've had many successes but we've had some issues too that we continually have to work through, is that how is it that we minimize competition for resource, resources between the university and the community and also between, uh, within the university? So the big question, who's going to be PI, who's gonna be co-PIs, where do the resources, resources go, what is it that really, really can fund here is important. We've had uh, challenges in influencing policy, and all I have to say is it's the city of Detroit, so and I think you can understand some of the challenges that we've had facing bank bankruptcy 
same issues with lever leveraging city and state funding. Um, we've had to develop a number of new infrastructures within the community. So for example, when we did La Viva partnership, we had to develop an IRB. And so I don't know if any of you have done that, but it's ridiculously simple to fill out the papers to do uh, to get an IRB. But then in terms of the maintenance and making sure that they're doing good review, scientific review um, around human subjects is, is important. The other issue is dealing with, with success. And I think, again, the enterprise has gotten so big that, again, community members are being asked and, you know, they're on the speaker circuit and they're doing great programs and, but, you know, sometimes they have to attend to the day job of what they were, of what they're needing to do. Um, the issue of perceptions of power, again, is a continual struggle. Um, again, people see the university as big resources, big bucks, and you can really fund this if you want to, so why are you taking things from us? And again, not, recogni not recognizing or even realizing that you know, faculty members aren't necessarily big decision makers. They work in schools, and schools work in, within universities, so there's a whole hierarchy there. Um, the support for the infrastructure of, again, bringing these community members to the table once a month, um, it takes some infrastructure in order to develop and support. So again, finding funding to develop the infrastructure has been, has been challenging. And there has been some good university support, but I think like any research center, developing that's important. And then you struggle with the, again, the research focus of which is the URC to how is it that you blend with a practice focus there is a service and practice focus. So we've been able to move, um, get and develop some of that, but probably not as much as the communities will have liked. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about my, um, my work. Um, again, as uh, Susan mentioned, my work is focused on sexual risk reduction primarily for Latino youth. It's an evidence-based intervention, and that I, I've talked a little bit about how I used a community-engaged uh, approach, not necessarily a participatory reaction uh, approach. So community were, were involved in terms of the approach of the intervention, some of the intervention content and design, both youth and families, um, getting uh, communities to agree to the study design, which is a randomized control design. <laughs> Um, I recall I was trying to do a, an RCT in, um, in, in Detroit, and we were uh, sometimes communities have issues with an RCT because they don't want people to get a lesser, lesser treatment. So we were going to do a sexual risk reduction, and then we were going to do fo focus on physical activity. And so one of the community members says, you know, I have an issue with, with you know, the, you know, with doing, with the control group. And I thought he was going to say, well, you know, they should also be getting the same information. But he said, you know, doesn't, you know, he said, I think I've read where people who engage in physical, youth who engage in physical activity like sports are less likely to engage in sex. So if you have a physical activity intervention, isn't that going to weaken the, the effects of your intervention? Are you going to be able to prove that? And I was like, oh my gosh. So, so again, it just, uh, it's again, I think we were successful in bridging some of the understanding that we needed to be able to do. But uh, again, there was no issue with the physical activity intervention. In terms of the implementation, we work to hire people within the community as uh, site coordinators, as people who facilitated the intervention. So we, you know, gave them training, we gave them money, gave them support. We had uh, people who in the community who were involved as project assistants, who helped to recruit for us, and who were our project staff. So again, this wasn't it, this then wasn't a study, but it was a program that they looked at and they embraced. And so again, it's a reason why I love to do intervention research. And so the next phase, um, again, other work that I've been involved in in terms of dissemination of this really comes from the CDC model. Um, I've been funded by the CDC for the replicating effective um, programs, and it's taking, again, information and the protocols that we had from this uh, RCT to be able to hand and teach communities to be able to, uh, to conduct the intervention with fidelity. And again, fortunate with the CDC that once we were able to develop these materials, they had a whole training and support infrastructure around this to be able to support communities in the implementation. So the products that we had to develop were, again, a, a curriculum, an implementation manual that had um, information about what is the intervention, what does it take to do, how much money does it cost, what are the resources involved, what are you know, situations that we should do. 
We had to develop a training of facilitators manual so that others could train facilitators to be able to do this. Then we had to develop a trainer of trainers manual to train, you know, trainers to train facilitators to teach this to adolescents. A monitoring and evaluation framework so that again when people were implementing the intervention and they had to evaluate the outcomes we had both process and outcome measures in there and so helping communities to be able to do this importantly we had to be able to step back and say why was the intervention effective and we were able to know some of that from the theoretical framework that we used but also from the experience that we had in deliver delivering the interventions. So we had to say, I think we've, we're naive to think that just because everything's in a manual that's written, that communities are going to take this product and deliver it as exactly as, as you had written. In fact, usually the first thing communities want to do is say, you know, I like this, but I'm going to take this here and I'm going to move this over here. I'm going to put this in here because this works better. And then suddenly you have something that looks nothing like your intervention. So again, it's trying to say, you know, if you want the same results, these are the six key things that you have to do uh, to get the same type of results. And if you don't, um, and again, here are some areas that you can make modifications in. So again, with community participants, we recruited three community-based agencies across the country. We had them review our materials. They came and we trained them in the curriculum and they were able to develop, um, we asked them to deliver it a couple of times. And what we found is that agencies were able to carry out the program with fidelity, that the adolescents and facilitators, um, again, outside of the RCT reacted favorably to the program. Our facilitators loved it. Um, there was affirmation and training for uh, affirmation for our, our training materials. They could read them. They were usable for them. And importantly, they were able to identify uh, things outside of an RCT that we hadn't encountered. So it's like, well, how do you deal with this? It's like, well, I don't know. What do you think? You know. So again, um, it was that that shared problem solving component. So as a result, um, the intervention, the dark oranges are all states that have um, been using the curriculum and are using it as part of, um, they get state funding from CDC or for the Office of Adolescent Health to replicate um, and to do this programmatically. And I've had the opportunity to, to meet many of the people in communities that are using the interventions and I'm really just inspired by the creativity in terms of how they use the program in particular health settings. I think the one, uh, one a group of colleagues who were in Las Vegas um, decided that they, as a place for the intervention, they would do this in, in people's homes. So almost like Tupperware parties, but they find a parent who's willing to have these kids come in for three hours, you know, the six hours total. They open up their homes, kids come there, the facilitator does all the work that she needs there, and it's like, what a great, you know, what a great idea. So again, some really important creativity. So one of the things that, um, that I've been involved in recently is another part of st uh, study. Again, if we're looking at evidence-based interventions and we're saying people need to have some sort of training in the interventions in order to be able to uh, carry, the, carry them out with fidelity, and in order to do that, you need to do an in-person setting, and you know, that costs money, and if you, know, you can't give them training, then they just read a book, and even though the cookbook is good, there's still issues that they come to deal with. We wondered if there was a better way to deliver some of the training that we needed to do. So many of my colleagues who are in this world do a lot of webinars, and I, I don't know if you, you know, you see webinars and, you know, they're, they're sort of, they're passive, and that type of work wouldn't work well for the type of interaction and how we train our facilitators. So colleagues of mine at Michigan, and, and who are more technology adept than, than myself, um, we worked to see it, whether we could um, use a program called Second Life, which is a, a gaming, um, it's a virtual world, virtual reality world, um, to use that as a way to train uh, facilitators to deliver the curriculum. So here, um, here's my team. These are the avatars. I don't, I don't know if you can recognize me, but here, here I am right yeah, here. Very nice. Very nice. Um, very tall, and this is our this is our training space. Our training space is in Wolverine Island. We own um, two islands. Michigan owns two islands, and I wasn't very happy with the uh, with the design of the building because I think it looks like a Dan and yogurt cup myself. <laughs> but I love the inside of the training. I love. I was able to paint. The, I made them repaint the walls because they didn't have very pretty walls, but. Um, we were able to simulate the, the, the training as it would be in real life. 
We provided training for these facilitators to get into Second Life, provided lots of technical assistance so that they wouldn't be overwhelmed by the technology. We were able to deliver um, the training almost in total um, in terms of how we were doing that, and importantly, people were able to interact. So we did this, um, what we found, this is the type of participant feedback that we got, that it was interactive, there was great discussions, good hearing, um, good listening, et cetera. We were able to compare the results of, again, how they liked um, the in-person in -person training as compared to a Second Life training, and what people said was that they liked the second, they liked the face-to-face -face training better. Um, but it wasn't that, even though it was significantly different, it was from outstanding to very good. So this is a very feasible way to be able to, um, to be able to move forward. So again, things that I've learned in terms of community involvement and dissemination is that they were helpful in terms of development and review of new materials. They provided critical feedback, and let me tell you, communities don't, <laughs> don't hold back in terms of what they like and don't like. Um, importantly, they're champions and advocates for the program and for the trainings. And as I said, great supporters of the program and also great, great innovators. So other work that's going on at, at Penn, again, in terms of community engagement, is work by my colleague Bridget Bronner, who, again, focuses on HIV, but again, with mentally, uh, with mentally ill adolescents, and again, has been working with a number of agencies, both that service um, uh, adolescents as well as adolescents themselves. So again, this is an intervention that is funded by the CDC that she's in the process of, of testing. Another one of my colleagues, Terry Littman, um, has her Dance for Health that started off as a way of trying to prevent um, uh, diabetes in population in West Philly. So again, working with health system, with health schools and also schools has developed this Dance for Health and it's taken off in um, different, a different areas and different schools. So it started off with school-age children and we also have a uh, program using uh, uh, I don't say wheelchair aerobics, but sitting down aerobics um, in our health center that again, people can look and move to music. And so again, it's, it's a great way that we've been able to involve our students in this as well here. And again, here's results of, uh, again, some of the work that she's done. Importantly, it's a strong um, relationship that we have with the communities around this particular program. They look for us to do that and important um, both weight loss and important uh, engagement in physical activity once the program has been completed. I think another one of my colleagues, and I, I just love the work that she's doing, Dr. Kathleen Brown, is working and developing a, um, a program to help sexually exploited women recover from and thrive after prostitution and drug use. So working in combination with the uh, Philadelphia City Jails, they identify women who instead of going to jail are live in these, this subsidized housing, transitional housing in a system that's both nurse managed and nurse run. And so again, the program focuses both on um, intensive treatment for addiction and mental health related issues, but also providing skills for job reentry and training. And the goal at 12 months is that each woman will have sustainable housing. So uh, with funding from the Buffett Foundation, um, the program is well underway and we're really looking uh, forward to some results. But again, these are just a number of the community partners that uh, Kathleen is working with to be able to support, uh, to support that and to support transition. And I, I know that as she moves forward, when we're looking at placing women, we'll need to have more, uh, more involvement. But again, this is the type of work um, that works at engaging communities. So in terms of partnership and community engagement, we talked about the whole issue of developing trust, but I think here are some keys in terms of what's needed to, to move forward. And that's periodic assessment of the role of partners. I mean, just because you started in, in, at one place doesn't mean periodically you don't need to check in. Is this working for you? Are you getting what you need? What's the burden like? Is there anything we should be doing differently? There has to be a good assessment of the needs and progress of the project and also the partnership. Being able to provide technical assistance um, for communities as the research goes along. And again, I think it's some of the benefit when you have community engaged work is that you are leaving participants with, again, different skills that work and look and apply in different areas. There has to be continued care and, and feeding. I mean, people can't feel neglected. The communication is really important. And again, being able to respect the for diversity, 
the culture of learning. Again, that's, we need respect from the communities in terms of understanding what our J jobs are, and importantly, um, the culture of the setting. So again, recognizing that as well. So in terms of future directions when we think about community engagement is, is work is that I believe that we need to have a paradigm shift in terms of how we approach communities. That we have to move between beyond project and funding dependent and really work on developing a sustained relationship. And we as individuals can't do that by ourselves. I think it has to be a relationship between institutions. It may start off as individuals, but it has to be between um, uh, between, between institutions. We have to move between investigator or community initiated to really looking at developing joint agendas between the two. We need to work, move beyond research only to really how is it that we can integrate education practice and policy. As I said, moving beyond individual or school relationships to again working on in a university and multidisciplinary partnerships. So one of the things that we're looking to do at, at Penn, uh, when I started in July, uh, there were four other deans that started along with me. So we call it our freshman, our freshman class. Um, but I've um, worked and um, certainly identified key areas of, of commonalities with the uh, School of Education and also Social Work Policy and Practice, which I know you're working on educational programs. But we're working, we've identified areas around women and uh, youth and families that we really want to work on together. And so we did an assessment of what are we doing in that space, what are the areas that we can work together, what's going to be our area of greatest impact, and we're going to start with the West Philadelphia area, but we're excited about what it is we're going to be bringing both from a service component, a research component, and what we can do to change curriculum to again prepare our students to work in interdisciplinary teams. And so again, moving away from just faculty as PIs to uh, community as, as PIs when possible. When we think about community engagement and dissemination, I think we have to take think of best practices and our evidence-based um, interventions as a process rather than just a packaged intervention. And again, being able to uh, uh, allow communities to adapt when, when appropriate or to adapt and evaluate that we have to emphasize the role, the control by practitioner, patient, client, community, or population. So what are the things that can be looked at, changed? How can that be best integrated into the services that they need to do um, beyond, beyond? We have to look at, um, emphasize local evaluation and self-monitoring so that again, they can, uh, communities can take a look at, is this working for our communities? What type of adaptations do we need to be able to have? And again, um, I think one of the issues with the dissemination piece, again, that the CDC has worked on and that we're, you know, constantly fighting is that people are all over the country are using our work, but we don't always get the feedback about what's working, what's not, what insights they have. So again, better partnerships, communication with folk who are using that is, is critically important. And then finally, research on the tailoring process and new technology. So if people are making those adaptations, does it work and how does it work and how can we get that information uh, move forward. So we have a long ways to go in terms of the work that we're doing with, with communities, but I, I find the work um, uh, very energizing. I love the idea that the work and the research that I do has an, an, has an impact both in terms of the process and in terms of final product. It's a, um, a journey that I think is well worth the investment for us as uh, individuals and for us as institutions. So thank you for the opportunity to be here and to share some of my work and I'll certainly look forward to the discussion. So we do have some time for questions if there are things that you'd like to um, ask Tony, first question is always the hardest. But we know that we're educating leaders, so we know somebody's going to raise their hand. Back there. Hello, Tony. Long time no see. Veronica Peña Vargas, a BC alum and a non. Um, member as well, and um, sister. Um, my greatest concern as a nurse and a nurse practitioner for so long is that we read these articles and we 
try to disseminate the information. But it's so hard in the community unless you are in a community health center or in a major hospital such as MGH or University Hospital. What would you say um, would be the next step to try to get the research out into the community, more into the suburbs, so that the patients that are out there, they're not, they might not be in the urban city living, but they still have the same problems as the city dwellers? Yeah, I think that's I, that's an important question. I think one of the issues that we've um, that we've struggled with or started to have conversations with is again where people get information. You know, where is it that people get information? So trying to find out find those outlets. But um, the areas that I'm concerned about is what's on the web, and you know, again, where people are accessing information and how is it that we can help. Um, patients, families, go to good sources, reliable sources, and again, us being the knowledge brokers around those components. I think what people suffer from is from knowledge overload and really not recognizing what, um, you know, what are trusted sources to be able to do that. So the, I think the approach that you're looking at or the question that you're asking with is, is more than just an individual approach, I mean, it really is an institutional approach to try and figure out how to do that outreach. And again, people need to figure, there has to be a need or there has to be re a request from some place um, to be able to do that. Um, so again, I would love to hear other ideas around that component, but I think just because it's out there doesn't mean that people are gonna be connected. And I do think we have a critical role to play in connecting people to that. Other questions, thoughts? Yes. You talked about people using your work um, as a learning tool and then adapting. Joan, we, we're going to give you a microphone, but thank you. Hi, I'm an old eagle. Um, <laughs> and not a pen. <laughs> and a classmate of Susan's. Yay. But of all now those things, wow. what I was going to say is that you had, uh, you had reported to us that people read research and with good intention um, tailor it to their population, to their skill set, to their community, to their resources. How do, you, how do we assure some kind of fidelity so that we get to pile up our data for good enough work um, versus that people in good intention believe that the modifications don't influence right. the paradigm or the right. design or the what you kept calling it fidelity, all I could think of is my broker, <laughs> um, <laughs> rather than as a research scientist, but the importance of that particular thing is really troublesome. It, as a clinical specialist at Mass General, one of the um, institutions that was alluded to by the first speaker, that each unit is its own culture, right. is its own island, right. and the thing that goes on unit by unit right. is not necessarily the Massachusetts general nursing practice. Um, and so for me, that the notion of that dissemination with some fidelity to the so what of the outcome versus you know, the research that dropped insulin on a bed sore in a right. very controlled way, to get it to the so what level for dissemination. Um, and so I'd like you to speak to that if you would. Well, if I had the, if I had the answer to that, um, I think the, maybe not the hardest thing, but I think certainly it, it takes you two minutes to realize that whatever you wrote down on a piece of paper or whatever you have in a, in a great manual doesn't mean people are gonna follow that because again, they have different knowledge than what you do and not everybody who is using a curriculum, for example, is going to attend a training. And if, even if they attend the training, if they think they know something better than you, that doesn't necessarily mean they're doing that. In our training approach is what I ask them to do. It's like, I know you don't, you know, when we was developing the intervention or when we were training our facilitators, they were telling me what I needed to change. And I said, I didn't ask you that. <laughs> you know? I said, you're not the expert. I'm the expert here. And I said, once you've delivered the intervention, then you can give me feedback. But, you know, not, unt not until then. Then I'll listen to you. And so, I mean, I had good relationships with the community. And what I asked, and again, in trainings, it's like all we're asking you to do is to try it on first. You can't start altering a dress if you don't try it on first. So try it on, and then if things don't work, then let's have this discussion. But again, you're only one person with one, inter you know, with one intervention, and again, hopefully you have people that are trained to be able to help people make those good decisions, and you try to be as clear as you can about what to do and what not to do and contact information, but 
You know, people just, people just don't. So funding agencies, people who provide funding for people to develop that pro or to implement that program have a little bit more control because they will do fidelity checks, they will have funding outcomes, but that's not, that's not just the, the general population. And again, as I said, my biggest, my biggest, re it's not regret, but my biggest sorrow is that I don't know what people are doing because I think they have some good ideas. I mean, it's a good feedback loop. Um, and I, I enjoy learning from, from our communities as well. So I think we have to figure out a way to make that loop a little bit more inclusive so that we can, you know, again, so that the science and the programs aren't, aren't stale. I mean, really, when you think about it, this is a program developed in 1999. And so think, you know, a few things have changed. And so um, it's a critical component, but I'm not sure how to, I'm not sure how to move around that. I think one of the things that you said that in your talk that was, didn't have a lot of attention paid to it is that notion of sustainability, the fatigue factor and the, each person, you know, th that the, you looked as if there was a plan to address that so right. that the loss of accuracy um, and interest didn't kind of get blunted by um, history, right. by, by use of the tool. So right. that, I think that's something that we have under attended to in nursing, um, I think somewhat because of, of money issues, as, um, as well as not cloning ourselves or mm -hmm. all of us being um, simulation or video techies. Right. But that the notion of how do you keep it going? They pass the test. How do you know in two months they're still able to hold those key areas where we know that 80% is gone in 20 minutes? Well, I mean, and again, you don't know that. You don't know that when you're, you know, providing a, uh, you know, uh, a treatment reg regime on medication. Right. I mean, because people make their own decisions based on whatever knowledge they have. So the only point I was making is that the notion of how do you manage to keep it alive and as it was intended, um, over the wear and tear and noise of our regular life, right. that that was addressed as a component, mm -hmm. but didn't have the kind of organizer that some of the other things. And I think. For me, that really resonated, and I wanted sure. to say thank you for that. Thank you. I think everybody's ready for happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> or for the excellent food that we can smell that is being provided in the back. So I hope that you will join me in thanking Tony for... Truly a remarkable, very thought-provoking, and I think we really need to take a hold, and I hope that when you go home tonight, you'll think about what is it that communities are doing with me and what am I doing with them? And if you can't talk about how you're engaged, whoever your community is, how are you gonna change that? That's a, a wonderful gift to have given us today. So please join us for further conversation and more talks. Um, wonderful food and um, something to drink in the back and I look forward to our continued conversation. Thank you for being here. <laughs>